actually before we start can i can i ask if if anyone who's who's joined us non sympraxian persons um <laughs> if anyone who's who's joined us has specific questions about this at, we'd love to hear them now it'll help us to, it'll help direct our our conversation because we've got a lot of material you're welcome to throw them into the chat or you're welcome to open up your audio line and open them before we get started if you like I, th I think this is Tom Duff. Um, I think from the perspective of Sandra Mahan and myself, we are coworkers. You know, we're we basically looked at the fact that once we finished our migration from 2010 last year up to SharePoint Online, we then looked at our info path and our SharePoint designer because we had a number of SharePoint designer 2010 workflows. And we looked at the fact that being that there was no date at that time, we figured SharePoint Designer 2010 workflows probably were the better risk between that and getting rid of InfoPath. So we had run the, uh, the modernization scanner and found we had like 858 workflows. And we've been working on remediation since what, March, whenever it was, <clears throat> and we are about 65%. So we probably have about 300 that are still left. It's going to be a push to get them done by November 1st. Yeah. Uh, I know we're on the right track. It's just, it's like, God, I was hoping this time wouldn't come, and it did, and oh well. And now I'm hoping they'll move the date at some point, but it is what it is. So that's kind of yeah. where we're at on ours. Okay, good. That's that's super useful. So, you're given how far along in the on the road down the road you are. What's what do you what do you need? Like what's what's going to be most helpful to you today? <laughs> I need like 40 hour days. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> miracles would be good. You know, hail marys, throw the pass. Okay. Um, I, I think I feel like we need a song going in here. All I need is a miracle. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Living on a prayer. Well, let's go with that one. Here. Oh, last minute. yeah, very nice. good. Nice. Well uh, done. A last yeah. minute call from the governor to reprieve as a reprieve. There you go. I like that even better. Yeah. yeah, I think it's more looking from individuals such as yourself who probably have a wider view of things than what we would have just working in a single organization. What are some of the things that you look at as being problematic? Uh, some of the things that people need to consider that they may not be looking at. Good. I will admit I'm really glad we're not sitting there looking at thousands and thousands of these things because I don't know how that's going to work for people. I just don't even get that. Um, but we have done a lot of the low hanging fruit. Now we're getting into ones that are a little bit more complex. I think we can do everything that we need to do, but that's I'm kind of looking for what are the things that perhaps we don't know that we don't know. Awesome. That's a terrific segue, Thomas, because we're, we're focused on three things today, right? One is assessing your workflows, which you've already done. Two is what are the options for remediation, which you're in the middle. You've gone down that path a bit. And the third are kind of pain points or incompatibilities to, to look out for. Yeah, the third right. one is probably the one that I'm a little bit yep. more concerned about. So that's good. Good. Yeah, and you have you're you're fortunate if you're on that third stage already, right? If the, it's the people who are like, how do I even know what I don't know, right? That's yeah. what we're gonna we're gonna start there and work our way to you. That's perfect. Thank you. Oh, no, great. So yeah. let's segue and get started. Your number, your number. If it, if it helps at all, I saw someone in another forum say that they have well over 115,000 workflows oh my god so Ouch. feel better <laughs> yeah that would have been keeping me up at night that's for sure <laughs> yeah. thanks mark my my perspective has been changed on the day now <laughs> yeah Gee, my my great. doesn't suck nearly as bad as i thought <laughs> yeah suck it to, suck it just you know a, a percentage <laughs> a sliding scale, scale. yeah <laughs> it's all relative all right Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us, and thanks, Thomas, for helping us get started there, get, adding a little context and, and flavor to it. Um, for those of you who haven't joined us before, welcome to Ask Some Praxis. This is intended to be a fairly open, uh, fairly open-ended and a fairly freewheeling uh, conversation with the team at Sympraxis. So, well, we've got a very specific uh, idea today about what we're talking about. We're going to focus on these workflows that, uh, you know, for which the uh, imminent demise has been announced for Microsoft and what to do about it. So for those of you who haven't been on these before, here's our team. And we, we all have slightly different roles. I think a lot of today is going to be the Todd show. 
uh, as, as an IT pro, and I think Mark will have some, some context. It's a little less dev-centric, so not to say that Julie and Derek, uh, we, we always treasure everything that you have to say. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, <laughs> you do? Is that, is that the employment but, agreement? Because I don't might not uh, be your day as much as some others, and Emily's obviously helped helped stage a lot of this and pro pro uh, produced a lot of the IP that you're going to see here, uh, which we're pretty excited about. So, um, SharePoint workflows, the three things we talked about with Thomas up front. We're going to, how do we assess the problem? How do we know what we know and know what we don't know? How do we execute new processes and remediate those workflows? And what are some pain points to look out for in the process? So the first thing is what's been announced. Um, I'll actually, I'd, I'd actually, I'll leave this on the screen. I'm not going to read the slides to you, but Mark or, or Emily, do you want to kind of do the capsule summary of here's the big announcement that came out? You, you gave us an option, Mark or Emily, and I talk fast. I talk first. Go for it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll handle this. Um, so uh, Microsoft has announced that uh, SharePoint 2010 workflows, which were initially announced with uh, SharePoint 2010, are going to be retired in SharePoint Online uh, starting very, very soon. They're not going to be available anymore in new tenants on August 1st and then will not be available at all. In other words, the existing SharePoint 2010 workflows that you may have will stop working on November 1st. SharePoint 2013 workflows, which were, which were, uh, which were available starting in SharePoint 2013, will have a little bit more life, lifespan, but you know, we would suggest very strongly that your move here not be to move from SharePoint 2010 workflows to 2013 workflows because their date, it, it's it's bound to be not too far off. But even, even with those, the, the there will be no new ones available on starting on November 1st. So, so this affects any SharePoint 2010 workflows that you've built yourself, and you would have done that with SharePoint Designer, most likely, though you could potentially have some Visual Studio-ish stuff that's in the background there. Um, Derek or Julie will tell me if I'm right about that. Um, and also some of the out-of-the-box um, uh, workflows. In fact, those five sort of out-of-the-box available in all sites workflows that you may have used in the past, like uh, uh, three-level uh, approval. I, I should remember the five names, but I don't. Um, but there are five that sort of come out of the box and you can actually configure through the UI. Those will also stop working because they're built on the SharePoint 2010 workflow engine. So that whole engine is what's retiring. Um, some people have said, oh, but you know, SharePoint Designer is supported until 2026. What's the deal? That's true. SharePoint Designer is supported in until 2026. It's the workflows that you work with with SharePoint Designer that are uh, being being uh, retired. So that's that sort of distinction. Well, and to add to that, the distinction yeah. is SharePoint Designer still works with on-prem SharePoint. Sure. Server. So sure. that's that's why the that's why it's the client still working is important because if you're up with on prem SharePoint, none of this applies. Right. And Sandra and, has a question. So <clears throat> maybe thank let's you. let her ask it. Uh, yeah, no problem. So Mark, so you said they're just gonna stop working November first or they're going to be like no longer supported? They will stop working. Oh, they're sheesh. actually going to turn okay. the <laughs> and and Todd will talk some more about this, but the 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 other bad part about that is that you won't necessarily see that they're not working. It's not like you're going to get error messages or something. They just won't be there anymore. Gotcha. Um, the workflows will still exist. You can still look at them, but they won't run. Okay. So one other follow-up question on that. So we migrated from our SharePoint 2010 servers because we had SharePoint 2010. We migrated to SharePoint Online. And so all of those SharePoint 2010 workflows you can now only access with SharePoint Designer 2013, but they're still in the SharePoint Designer 2010 mode. Right. Are all those going to stop working too, even though we can only get to them through SharePoint Designer 2013? Again, it's <clears throat> that's why I mentioned SharePoint Designer support versus workflow support. So SharePoint Designer 2013 is how you access those SharePoint 2010 workflows. The SharePoint 2010 workflows are what are going away. 
if you have SharePoint, if, if you're working in SharePoint Designer with SharePoint 2013 workflows, you have a bit more time. So if you have a split of both, 2010 workflows and 2013 workflows, which you wouldn't if you came from 2010, but if somebody does, fix the 2010 workflows first by converting them to flow, and we'll talk more about that. But you're still gonna wanna uh, convert the 2013 workflows as well, because as you can see from this slide, there's a there's a timeline here for, for those as well. Gotcha, thanks Mark, appreciate it. We yep. have another question too from Lou. Go ahead, Lou. So a little clarity around 2013 workflows. Are we talking workflow manager workflows? Or are we talking about a SharePoint 2013 server that had workflows built in it using SharePoint Designer? Yeah, so uh, some of this will get answered, and I don't know, is the next slide the assess slide? The next uh, slide is the assess slide. Okay, so one of the things we're going to talk about, this in storytelling, this is foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when we talk to the assess side, we'll uh, we'll sh we'll show that, and the workflow itself is a completely different kind of workflow. Like a SharePoint 2010 workflow is a completely different animal from a SharePoint 2013 workflow, regardless of which client you use. You know, SharePoint 20 SharePoint Designer 2010 or SharePoint Designer 2013, uh, re regardless of the type of server. So on SharePoint Server 2013, you could have a SharePoint 2010 workflow separate deals. Uh, and so I think when we do the assess part and I show you some of that, uh, that might clear some of these questions up. But the client you're using is not necessarily important. The server that it came from, except in Sandra's case, 2010 couldn't have 2013 workflows, but the server it came from is not necessarily important. It's it's the, when you look at the workflow itself, it's going to have a type. And if that type is 2010, then it's going to go bye-bye. It, and this is confusing to a lot of people. So the fact that you're you're asking these questions is totally normal. The fact that the fact that SharePoint Designer and and SharePoint Workflows are two separate things. They just happen to be things that you work with together, is what makes this confusing. It's the underlying workflow engine that's going away. SharePoint Designer is technically still supported, though it's becoming less and less useful as some of the underlying stuff it can do goes away. So the other thing that I think it's really important to mention here is if you're on-prem and you're staying on-prem, this is not a concern for you. This stuff will all keep working because you're running those servers, you're running Workflow Manager, you're running the engine that does SharePoint 2013 workflows. That all stays there. But if you have an inkling of migrating to the cloud, and this is, we've got a couple clients in this situation where, you know, as, as you did, Sandra and Tom, you know, you, you decided to migrate the workflows as they stood because you could, you kicked it down the road. We've been kicking it down the road with people for, for years now. You can, you can migrate those workflows to, to SharePoint Online. And then over time, as they become, as, as you retire them or as, um, you want to rebuild them, you would build flows instead. This now becomes a blocker for uh, so what, what might be a faster migration because you, you would have to rewrite those workflows um, before migrating to SharePoint Online. So if you're thinking you're going to like migrate to SharePoint Online before August 1st and squeak under the, squeak under the bar, that doesn't work because those workflows will still stop working. So they now, be, the, the workflows that you have on-prem, if you're migrating to SPO, now become a part of the migration process as opposed to just something you can kick down the road. Thanks, Mark. And this is, this is a, um, a judgment-free zone and, and a safe space. So like a lot of us, when we look at work that we did five years ago or 10 years ago, look at laugh and, and say to ourselves how much differently we'd have done it if we'd known then what we know now so like we've all got technical debt to pay off we all made decisions to invest in certain places or not invest in other places it's just this is not going to be focused on retroactively looking at what, what was good or bad about those decisions but where you are right now and what our path is going forward so to todd's point the first thing we do obviously is assess and todd can share with us some some insight on all right how do i get my arms around the scope of this problem today yeah so uh 
I, I, you know, like Mark and, and Mike have said, kind of stemming the tide, there is no way around this. There's no, you know, sneaking in under the, the wire or anything. So one of the first things that you want to do is you're, you know, trying to plan out what the next six months looks like is keep the problem from getting worse. And one of the ways that you can do that is on the client side, so on the machine side, on the SharePoint designer side, uh, disable the use of SharePoint designer and InfoPath. Uh, and this is kind of a tangential thing, but it's something to think about if you're in, a, in an environment where you can control the desktops, you can push out GPOs, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the, the fewer people that go in with SharePoint designer and create new magic workflows, you know, if you can tamp that down, there's gonna be less things to deal with. And that's kind of a weird problem because SharePoint designer workflows are so easy to create. We don't know where they're at and we don't know who's actively creating them. So we just can't take it for granted that there's not new ones showing up. So that's one of the things that you can do uh, is just kill, you know, nip that in the bud, keep any new ones from popping up as you're trying to inventory them and figure out uh, uh, which ones you need to get rid of. Todd, uh, is, that, that first, is that first one, if you find yourself in a hole, stop digging? Yes, the first thing to do okay. if you find right. yourself in a hole, okay. stop digging. Absolutely. Yes, and, and and stop other people from digging. You know, take all the shovels away. Yes. Right. Um, and if you do the GPO, you can control who can do it because obviously, as an admin or whoever's on your team helping, they're going to need SharePoint Designer to get in and look at the workflows and some of the other things we talk about. But if you can stem the tide a little bit, uh, that's one thing to keep in, keep in mind. The next piece, and where it really gets fun for me, is finding where the workflows are at, just kind of figuring out how big the, the, the problem is. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, one, so people who are familiar with me know that I love few things more than pimping my own blog. So this is the first time for those of you doing the drinking game, uh, this is your first chance to drink. Uh, I recently published a couple of blog posts on this process, you know, covering what the problem is and then kind of the steps through. And one of them was how to use the free SharePoint modernization scanner to scan your tenant and find out where these workflows are hiding. And so when we were talking earlier uh, with, with Thomas and, and whoever else it was was talking about which workflows to look at and all of that, this tool will tell you that. And I think in my blog post, I've got a screenshot of it, but it lists all of the workflows in your tenant and it gives you about 47 co columns of information. And one of them is the workflow type and it's either gonna say 2010 or 2013. No matter what else, that's the thing that you have to care about. It doesn't matter which version of SharePoint Designer you used the last time you touched it, uh, or you know which server platform it came from. None of that matters. It's that column that says 2010. Those are the ones that are going to stop working. Sadly, you know, the, the, the stroke of midnight on November 1st. So that lets you know uh, where to. Uh, you know, focus your efforts and all of that. Uh, Catherine in the chat room is saying, do we think how the user voice will help? Uh, I see, uh, I'm, I may be a little cynical. I see there being a 0% chance that this deadline gets moved. I would not expect there's any possibility of that at all plan for that. Uh, I don't think that, I don't think the governor's calling as, as Mike mentioned. Um, and Todd, to, to, about your blog, we don't have the links here. I don't know if Julie's putting them in the chat as we go or not. But one thing I failed to say up front is that the components that you're seeing in here, the assess, remediate, that overview with the timeline, um, we've put all of that into an infographic that, that Emily um, created for us. And we're going to give you a link to at the end of this that kind of stores and tracks all that information right in line. And I believe there are links to the relevant blog posts from Todd to dive into more detail, correct, Todd? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's and, all, and I play types. <laughs> yeah, and I did just happen to have that URL for that blog post handy. I don't. It was just an amazing coincidence, <laughs> but I was able to throw that in the chat room. So if anybody wants to look at it, and awesome. then if you scroll down, you can see the the Excel output. Again, that's the uh, that's the ones you're going to want to focus on. So, uh, you know, for, for folks that have a lot of workflows, trying to figure out which ones to start focusing on, again, that column uh, where it says 2010, those are the ones that you want to uh, want to focus on. Uh, if you already have ShareGate or some of the other tools, I'm not familiar with all of the other ones, uh, ShareGate will also generate a report that will give you all the workflows in your tenant. So if you've got ShareGate, fire that thing up. It's probably gonna create a little uh, better report for you. Gonna be a little better experience than running that SharePoint modernization scanner. But that modernization scanner is free. You just download it and my blog post does a, a good job of walking you through it. Uh, so once you've kind of got a picture of how big the bread box is, uh, then you gotta figure out 
you know, which ones out of that list of 2010s, which ones do you want to start looking at? And the problem with that uh, SharePoint modernization scanner is it tells you all your workflows when they were last edited, last touched, but not when they were last ran. So what we don't know is situations like Sandra's and Thomas's where it was very easy to migrate them all up to the cloud. So all the workflows went we don't know if anybody's touched them. We don't know if they're active. So we don't want to spend a bunch of time modernizing these workflows that have never been touched in SharePoint Online. So I've got another blog post that uh, tells you how to walk through that list and figure out which workflows have been used recently so that you can focus your efforts on those. And I do that by leveraging the workflow history uh, list each site has. So basically you take that, that spreadsheet from the second blog post, look at the sites and then look at that uh, that list and that will show you the workflows that are running. And then you'll know, you know, this one runs every day. This is a big deal. This workflow here, it hasn't shown up in six months. We don't care about it, but that'll let you prioritize uh, which workflows you're uh, looking at. Hey, Todd. Yes, hey, sir. Todd. I heard once upon a time that those workflow history lists get cleared out. They, is that true? That is true. One of the few rumors on the internet that is true, uh, despite what Abraham Lincoln said, you can believe some of the things that you read on the internet, and that is one of them. Um, and that's actually kind of how I remembered this, because I, I put the second blog post out about, you know, finding the workflows and kind of thought my work was done. And then a bunch of people started, you know, coming back and saying, well, how do I know when they've been run? And I don't know of a good way to do that. And then in the back dark recesses of my mind, I remember this workflow history list uh, filling up uh, databases back in the on-prem days because it didn't, you know, so there were people that wanted it to uh, clean out faster than six months, people who needed it for legal reasons that wanted more. And I'm like, hey, I wonder if that still exists online. And sure enough, it was there. Uh, so to Derek's point, that workflow history list does uh, rotate out after six months. So that might not matter because you might be able to say if that workflow hasn't run in six months, I don't care. Um, but you also, I think you can go into central admin and I don't know where that setting is at off the top of my head, but you could also go into central admin, I think, and extend that out a little bit. But again, those workflows are only gonna run for three more months, three and a half more months. So if it doesn't show up today, you know, you're going to get it for the next three and a half months because it's going to. Um, but yeah, so that will only show you the ones that have been executed in the last uh, six months. Uh, so then the next thing I've got a point to point 2A there. I feel dirty about that. And I've, I've thought about blogging this particular thing because there's some stumbling blocks. But once you know, you know, you've identified the workflows, you've identified the active workflows. And the next thing you need to do is figure out how to turn them into flows or, or whatever. And the only way that I know to do that is to connect to SharePoint Online with SharePoint Designer. Uh, and so you have to install that. And so I, I just feel dirty suggesting that. Like, I feel like after this is over, I'm gonna have to go uh, shower with my clothes on or something. Uh, but to connect to SharePoint Online, you need SharePoint Designer 2013. I think that that will install uh, next to current versions of the Office products without destroying anything. But honestly, I didn't even try it. I just uh, spun up a VM and I installed it in there. Uh, and you know, Hyper-V is free on Windows 10 and all of that. Uh, so I just, I didn't even want to mess with it. So I installed uh, SharePoint Designer and VM. And there'll also be some cathartic uh, fun after this whole mess is over, of just deleting that VM with extreme prejudice and making SharePoint Designer go away. Um, but you'll have to install SharePoint Designer on a machine. And then you would connect to your, your your site from that spreadsheet that has the workflow in it, just like you would any other thing. You'll get prompted for, for authentication. One tricky point with this is that in order for SharePoint Design to, Designer to authenticate against your SharePoint Online site, that site needs to allow customize or add pages, which is a new permission that they added in SharePoint Online a while back. And by default, deny is turned on, which means you can't connect with SharePoint Designer. Now, you're probably asking yourself, if you can't connect with SharePoint Designer, how did the workflows get there in the first place? Reasonable question. Uh, another thing that requires that is ShareGate when you do a migration. The other way the workflows could get in, ShareGate also requires that you turn off that uh, deny uh, custom uh, pages. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how those workflows would get up there. And that can be shut off afterwards. So somebody could have created a workflow, put it up there, and then shut that off. But the problem is if you connect with SharePoint Designer to a site where that deny is turned on, the error that you get is uh, like authentication failed or something like that. And that's really a bad uh, error message because especially if you're logging in as a user that you're positive can log into that site, 
getting an access denied error is very confusing, but it's probably that uh, customize, uh, deny customize thing. So you got to flip that to zero, and then you can connect to SharePoint Designer. The workflows are on the left. You can start walking through and, and taking a look at them. Um, I've talked a lot there. I've been kind of watching some questions in the chat room. Uh, Lou says that it will, it will uh, install next to the Office clients well. You're a braver man than I, Lou. I would not uh, do that to any machine that I respected, but I'm glad to hear that that worked for you. Um, any other questions about the assessing stuff? I, haven't, I don't see if anybody's got their hands raised. I don't see any more on that one. All right. Okay. Um, so we've got, we've got some stop the bleeding, stop yep. digging. We've got some, let's have a look at what we have here and let's prioritize them. And then even installing SharePoint Designer 2013 with a clothespin on our nose to, to dig in a, a little bit more. Can, should we transition now into how we execute against, okay, we know what's got to be rebuilt. What, what are our options? We, we ready to turn the page to that? I think so. I, I think I am. Thanks, Todd. That was a great, great start for us. So execution, Thanks. I think we're handing off to... So Mark, Mark's going to walk us through, and you'll see these numbers are a continuation of what we did in the assessment phase. When you get our infographic, it'll make sense. They'll fall right in line with each other. These are the steps in the process. So Mark, do you want to take away uh, some of the options we have for executing on this? Nah. All right. Um, okay. So I, th I think the, the first and easiest thing to do is you know find workflows that you just don't care about and shut them off. Um, there may be things running that that you you don't really need or that have been running for years and you don't even realize are, are, are running. Um, the the, the non-business critical thing is always a little bit of a tough phrase because why would it exist if it wasn't considered critical at one point? But um, the, you know, this is an opportunity to definitely definitely think about segmenting those workflows. Um, you know, Todd's assessment uh, suggestions give you the data that you need to understand what you have, but don't treat everything the same way. You know, lots of times we'll look at things and we'll sort of put them into ABC buckets. You know, A's are the absolutely most important. If this, if this doesn't run, we're all going to die kind of things. And C might be the stuff that maybe runs once a year and you can worry about it a little bit later because it's not going to have such an impact. Um, so think think about how you're going to balance the, the work so that you focus on the most important stuff first. Um, that's actually going to be a harder thing, maybe uh, sort of politically or or whatever, than than it than it make it sound because you're going to be talking to your users and everyone's going to think everything's really really important. But you just have to do some prioritization because you have a, a limited amount of time. So. The next thing really is to is to think about how you're going to go about this um, this mitigation, this remediation. And our our recommendation, and Julie and I have been actually discussing this on a on a chat in the background, is is very strongly that you go and you write all of your workflows with Power Automate. If you decide to go from 2010 workflows to 2013 workflows, um, uh, let me paint that a little bit. So first of all, if you've written a lot of 2010 workflows, you may not be able to rewrite them in 2013 workflows because the, the actions are different. The way those two kinds of workflows work um, may not even allow you to write the, the 2010 workflow uh, in, in a 2013 workflow. Um, if you haven't, if you if you're unfamiliar with how 2013 workflows work, you're going to have to learn some stuff to understand those differences. So my suggestion, I'll stick with my suggestion because Julie and I don't necessarily agree, and that's okay, um, is that you go and learn Power Automate because that's where you're going to be working going forward. Um, so the 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 hopping to 2013, unless you really understand how 2013 workflows work and you think that that's going to shore something up for a short period of time, I would say skip altogether because you're, you're going to end up doing the work twice. I also, I can't tell you a date, but I don't believe that the 2013 workflows are going to be out there for very, very much longer either. Um, and this is not just, you know, Microsoft wanting you to, I've, I've heard the complaint, you know, oh, they're just trying to, to bump up the, the licensing costs for Power Automate. Well, you you have a pool of of uh, um, 
of runs with anything that's in Office 365, Microsoft 365, unless you're using premium connectors, which you're not with 2010 or 2013 workflows, you, um, you don't need any additional licenses. You've got 5,000 runs per user per month, which are pooled. So those are big numbers. And this is not, so, so this is not where Microsoft is gonna get rich pushing us all into Power Automate. Power Automate is simply the answer. If you want to stop in 2013 workflows along the way, just know that it's going to be a short term fix and it's really not, it's not I wouldn't recommend it. Um, there may be some third party tools that will help with this. I'm not aware of any. Um, did we have any thoughts on that? I know we have a bullet for it. So Nin Nintex is the only other workflow platform yeah. I know of. Yeah. Okay, so so we, I, I just need my memory jog. So so yes, there are there is an Intex. I think K two is also still available in SharePoint Online. You know, you could use something other than Power Automate to rebuild these workflows. That's fair. Um, I don't think I, I think Power Automate does you know ninety nine point some percent of of at what most workflows do. The most common workflow that I see anywhere is something happens and we send an email. Believe me, Power Automate will cover that just fine. And it will cover most of the things that you need to need to do that are more complex than that too. But it's different. So the trick is to come up to speed with Power Automate as fast as you can. Um, managing a process outside of Microsoft 365 is actually a very interesting bullet. You know, we, we write workflows for things that generally are very repeatable. And so we want to be sure that we're, we're repeating that process in the same way every time. Think about when what your options are to turn off some workflows for the period that it takes for you to rebuild them in Power Automate and just do things manually. You know, um, maybe approving a document that you, know, you, you have an approval process in place that you could just you know, everybody, nobody lives down, works down the hall from anybody anymore, but maybe you could just work on it in a collaborative way instead of running a workflow. Um, I think a lot of workflows that are historically there may not represent a process that is as important as it seemed when the workflow was created or whatever. So just as a mitigation step, it doesn't, you, you have to think about what happens if this workflow just doesn't run for a while and can you get, get, get by without that? That, and Mark, that's, yes, sir. Mark, I think you know something else that we were thinking about when we were talking about that managing the process outside of Office 365 or Microsoft 365 is, you know, if you have an SAP or a learning management system or one of those tools that maybe didn't exist in 2010 or 2012 when you created the workflow in the first place, um, to say manage your yearly ethics, uh, you know, your yearly ethics attestation. You know, that's something that you may be able to do in your HRS system or in your learning management system. So sort of look at, as you're as you're looking at all of these, figure out the right tool for the job. And if it's still Microsoft 365, great. But if it's an HRS, then maybe push that content to the HRS. Yeah, well, it could be part of your prioritization process, right? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Part of the argument we were having is you've got till November and if you've got the 15,000 or whatever that person said they had, you got to prioritize and you got to know you're not going to get through them all. So yep. what do you do? And I think it's part of identifying the ones that you know you absolutely can't do any other way as the highest priority ones, you know? So. Yeah, I've seen, I, I know I've seen, uh, and it's a little dated at this point, but when people were migrating from Lotus Notes into Office 365, they would off, often out, offshore that, that effort because there were ways to sort of brute force it. But they would treat every Lotus Nodes database as if it was equal to all other Lotus Nodes databases. There was never any prioritization. So, you know, you'd say you have 750 applications when in fact there were only about 12 or 15 that were that critical that they and, and they should have been first and they should have been done well instead all and, and this is a specific example i'm thinking of but i saw multiple you know all 715 got converted and then they shut down a bunch of them because they didn't matter right so 
So it's 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 the same thing as you know when you move move houses and you pack everything in your boxes. Don't take all the crap that you're going to throw away once you get there, right? So you're not moving in this case, but you are going to you lift and shift, reconfigure the reconfigure the living room at least. So, yep. um, hey, hey Mark, before you move on from this, I'd I'd love to I'd love to hear from you or from our other colleagues if there are resources that we recommend to get up to speed on Power Automate, because a lot of us have invested time and effort in doing this ourselves over the years. And I think a lot of people are gonna be looking for guidance on that. I think, I think that really depends on how you learn. I think the good thing is that there are multiple, uh, there are multiple content pools out there for you to learn how Power Automate works. For example, Shane Young has a great set of videos so if you if you like to learn by video, which is not my favorite thing, that's that's a great a great resource. Um, if you want to read um, about how people do things, there are some there are forums for Power Apps and Flow, and I lump them together because the platform is the same, um, where you can search for things that that you want to do, and you're going to find hits on those forums. Um, Note that the platform has changed a lot over time and very rapidly. So make sure you're searching for posts that are relatively recent so that you don't try to do something that is no longer valid. Um, I think that there probably are some courses in places like um, Pluralsight, et cetera. Um, there are people who blog about how Power Automate works. So again, try and think about what your learning style is. I think we, we sometimes underestimate those differences and seek out seek out a resource that that sort of matches that. Um, you know, I, I think you could you could also hire outside consultants, and we're not we're not necessarily looking for that work. So I'm not I'm, this is not a sales pitch, but you could also hire hire, uh, hire outside consultants to m help help with all of the conversion. You know, rewriting your 2010 workflows and Power Automate. But I think the key thing there make sure this, is to make sure that they are teaching you how they're doing that so that you'll be more self-sufficient going along. So back to the Lotus Nose example to keep it neutral. You know, if you offshore it all and everything gets converted, but you don't understand how it was all converted, you're not necessarily in a better boat. But you can use outside consultants to do the work and teach you. So that's another learning way, uh, another way to learn what you need to know. Yeah, I wanted to jump in. Uh, as much as it pains me, uh, uh, Shane's blog is pretty good for this kind of thing. And in because of this particular thing, he's got a blog post about this, and he takes some of like the the built in twenty ten workflows and shows how to quickly turn those into flows. And so he's got some. I, I learned some stuff in there, so that would be a good one to watch. That's like fifteen minutes or something. Yeah. Build and deploy. So that's just you got to do it, right, Mike? You're you're gonna make me say something about number seven. <laughs> no, Mark, you, you you nailed it. I think I think we're 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 pretty clear there. I think it was pointing people to some of the resources to help them get up to speed fast. I felt was real was really important here. But we get we get that that yeah we have, that has to be the next step, right? Build, deploy, test, support, blah blah blah. Anything yep. else on execute, Mark? And are, uh, are there any questions in the actually, chat? Uh, there was something that Tom said and uh, took a background note. Um, one of the things you can do with flows that's that's pretty cool is you can have sort of parent-child flows. So, uh, for instance, if you have a bunch of sites where you want to have the same workflow running, same same process, let's use a generic word, same process running on a number of different document libraries, you can add a flow to each one of those that's very simple. All it, all it really does is um, wait for the trigger event and then it calls a master, or I'm not supposed to use that word anymore, a, a, a main flow, sorry, Derek, a main flow that um, actually does, does the majority of the work, okay? So you've got these little sort of stub child flows that call the big, the big flow that does the work. That's the same across all of those different, different lists or libraries. So what you're what you end up doing is passing in the right data to that big flow to do the work. That's not something we saw people doing a lot with with SharePoint Designer workflows because it didn't it didn't really it, it didn't really work there. Um, that that is another way to sort of reduce the amount of work you need to do. Focus on that big sort of engine doing the heavy lifting flow, 
and then just sort of call it from from the various locations. Um, is that is that something that you see in a lot of your organizations? Those of you who are on the call, you know, the same, basically the same process running in lots and lots of different places. Mark, I think we have a bullet on this in the pain points too, correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. We do. We talk about reusable workflows, so in that context as well. Yep. Maybe if we shift into that, and I think some of this stays with you certainly <coughs> to, to a degree. We've got about 20 minutes left. I want to make sure we uh, we get everything in in the hour, and I think we're fielding questions as we go, which is perfect. It's exactly what we want. So let's go to let's go to some of the pain points and some of the things that are likely to trip you up yeah. through this process. So Mark, I think we stay we stay with you here. Everybody's here tired of me though. Um, so, so we, we originally were calling these um, feature gaps, but in actual fact, they're not feature gaps. And and I, I was asking around on Twitter. We actually we, we all sort of put out our feelers to try and figure out, you know, what do people see as the biggest problems in this in this process? And very very little came up, or I'm, I'm not sure. I think we have one thing that came up that that is a an actual feature gap, something that you can't do in in flow, as opposed to something that you just do differently. So that that's that's why we've switched the 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 phrase from uh, feature gaps to pain points. Also, have added this to a a, a, um, a post that Chalks did in, as part of this announcement that that talks about how. You know, from a Microsoft perspective, how they they think about mitigating things. So these things are in there as well, and so they will. And I think we have a link to that in the, at the end. They will continue to be updated as well. So keep keep an eye for that. So first thing, 30 day run limit for flows. So a flow can't just run forever. You know, if you do have those those flows that are sorry workflows that run for a year or you know two years or whatever or perpetually, it, flows don't do that. They they have a 30 day run limit. So, so the mitigation step here for this is that um, you just you build the flow so that every 30 days, if it hasn't had any work to do, it just calls itself, and and that's that's sort of on the back end. You, it's a it's an architectural uh, decision, a way to, to a way to make these things last longer. It's just restarting itself, or. Um, you know, you have a, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you instead of having it run, if, if, if it's something that needs to run on an event, you can also run it on a timer. You can run something else on a timer that, that just restarts that same flow. It seems a little clunky, but it makes sense because lots of times these flows that have long life cycles just sit there and continue running, but really don't have anything to do. Um, so, so there is a there is a way to get around that. Custom permissions on list items. If you're using uh, workflows to set permissions on individual objects, individual items, or or um, individual documents, you can use the HTTP call to to an HTTP call to um, the REST API in order to do that. So that's actually another it's it's another gap filler. So if there's something that doesn't that that flow doesn't have an action for that you want to do on items or documents in lists and libraries, there is the HTTP um, action that you can call to to do anything that the REST APIs cover that there that, that those actions don't cover. Um, same a question. Yep, Sandra has a question. Sorry, I had a quick question on that. So is the custom permissions on the list like using the impersonation step that we had in SharePoint 2010, Designer 2010? So the impersonation step is on one of the one of the following slides. That's something oh, sorry. That, that's all right. That's something that you actually can't do in um, in a power automate. Um, so typically um, th this is one of the reasons for running um, your your power automate flows using what essentially amounts to a, a service account because you can have a, a more privileged account that runs these things and can do things that, that the, the current user doesn't or, or can't. Flows are different than, than 2010 and 2013 workflows in that they don't run in the context of the current user, they run in the context of the flow user. So it's a different model and um, Generally, the, the person who's building the flow has 
greater permissions than the person who is running the flow. So that sort of becomes unimportant. But at the same time, you want certain things to happen sort of in the context of the current user. Like you need to look up the current user's manager or something like that. So that's part of the context that you get in that flow. And so you can still do those things. Um, the other thing that you can do, the second, the second chunk of this impersonation idea is that you can do things like write an Azure function that you can call with a, you know, call, a do a REST call to with the HTTP, to HTTP connector. So you, you can, in other words, you can get into more complex um, um, architectures if impersonation um, is, a, is a significant uh, requirement for the kinds of things you want to do with workflows. Derek or Julie, do you want to talk in at all about how all well, that? Well, I'm I'm I I'm posting in the chat um, a link to my blog post on that subject, although slightly outdated. Um, and then, you know, of course, the only downside of that is if you do this, it's the premium version of the HTTP connector. Um, to Derek's point in the blog in the chat, um, you can do an HTTP call to SharePoint, which was on the last slide. And that's not premium, but an HTTP call to anything else is premium. Right. Um, and so then it doesn't really matter what that back end is either. I mean, um, it, the idea simply is that whatever thing that you are invoking via that HTTP call has the power to do what you need it to do. So in this scenario that um, I used, it was like I wanted to create a little, a little UI that allowed somebody to submit a help desk ticket, which was just a list in a, a site that the IT people had access to. We don't want everyone to have access to that site. We don't want everyone to have access to that list. So we need to elevate permissions to allow that item to get written into that list. And we do that by having a flow where they uh, submit their information. The flow then makes an HTTP call to an Azure function that has uh, certificate credentials that can write into that list. So it's that level of complexity. It is definitely not 100 level though, and or even 200 level. It's it's significantly more complicated than that. So, so yeah. with in in place of the impersonation, we've been using the stop sharing an item or a file and then grant access to an item or a folder. Is that not a good way to do it? Well, it gets the job done certainly. I mean, you you could you can and you could do that with the HTTP connector with um, two REST calls. So, or gotcha. you might be able to do it in one. I can't remember exactly what that API is, but um, you're you're essentially changing the permissions on that specific item, correct? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, the 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 the, the outcome is the same. Um, you would just be using the HTTP connector instead. Okay. Well, and we're well, cheap, could, so I don't want to pay for the HTTP. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Uh, well, there is a there is there is an out of the box not premium, and the, Sandra, this is what I think you're talking about. Is there's an action in Power Automate called stop sharing. Mm -hmm. That's the one. So you yeah. can do that. Yeah. And then there's create the sharing link. Uh, there's the create sharing link action as well. Um, oh, okay. I hadn't seen that one. I've got the grant access. Yep. Uh, so you accent, can. So, okay. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not the same thing, um, but it's close. Like you could basically set individual granular level permissions, um, you know, down to the user level. Like if you were going to an item in the UI, saying grant Derek, Julie, and Mark, but not Sandra and Mike. You know, okay. um, it, you can you can do stuff like that. So it's a, although actually I just looked and I think I saw a new one in here. <laughs> um, they, I will say that they're constantly, and no, that was something else, they're constantly adding new actions. And I think while the while the user voice may not get them to change the deadline, it may accelerate the release of some new actions that help alleviate some of these pain points. So I don't have any knowledge otherwise, but you know, I just sort of point that out. For example, there's there's one that they they've said they're they're working on. And they're going to try to get out as fast as they can, which allows you to uh, have a trigger that reacts to a change of a of a field or a column instead of just an item. And if you think about the work you had to do in 2010 or 2013 workflows to sort of make that magic happen, 
that yes all, all i that remember works. doing that with so multiple different. fields old value new value and you would yeah. run Ooh. the flow and right. then compare the two and then write it over but then you would trigger the flow if the thing changed yeah it's yeah. it was tricky so, that will be so awesome some, some things will get easier they're not they haven't promised that that will be out by the deadlines but they have said it, they're working really hard on it so um we, we've mentioned the http connector uh, several times i do want to just reiterate if you use the HTTP, HTTP connector to make calls to the SharePoint REST endpoints, that's not premium. Um, it's if you're trying to use HTTP calls to other sources. And anybody? And that is other yeah. anything other than SharePoint. If it right. doesn't have SharePoint in the URL, it is premium. So Azure, Graph, anything right. outside well, the, of the ecosystem, that's all premium. But most, of, you know, if you think about the things that you do in SharePoint 2010 or 2013 workflows, they're all doing stuff with with SharePoint, unless you've built custom actions, which we may get to um, as a, as an aside. So another thing that you want to think about, and I did mention it uh, already earlier, is just thinking about the concept of a service account, uh, having a, a, a sort of a virtual user who runs the flows that are critical to your organization. There isn't sort of this enterprise uh, level thinking around how flows work. Um, it's very much tied to the to the connection uh, connections of the user who creates the flow. You can replace those and you can share flows, but there isn't this sort of service account idea. So you might create a user called, you know, flow magician or something. First name flow, second name magician. Um, <laughs> And, and use that for the for the flows that um, are really really crucial, and maybe share them with a couple of people to do the do the actual work with, work on them. So it's just something to think about as a way to centralize the management of flows and make it a bit easier, especially if you have an organization where there's a higher level of turnover, because that sort of handoff can be a little tricky. We have a question from Catherine. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. You know, one of the questions I have is when you run um, flows with uh, either your account as the service account or a service account, all the changes to the SharePoint list show as being made by you instead of being made by the person who maybe triggered the flow. Do you guys have an approach to deal with that? That is correct. <laughs> 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 Sounds like no to that second part. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, 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 again, it's sort of a difference, the, the fundamental architectural difference between uh, workflows and flows is that they, the flows run with the connectors that, uh, of, the, of the account that you set up to, to manage those connections. So it, it, another benefit of having that service account is that that makes a lot more sense than having it say Mark when Catherine did it. Um, at least you, you can say, you know, oh, Flow Magician did the work. Um, but right, if you're yes. using it as an audit trail, yeah. it's totally. very difficult. Then you start having to add, you know, what time was it changed and by, yeah. you know, who was the person who made the change? Yeah, and, you could have the flow obviously write to a separate field, field. but it's then not yeah. that, it's not the official modified, modified on. You'd have to have a flow said so and so <laughs> did it, uh, <laughs> this, you know what I mean, which is so. Yeah. So it's awkward, but um, it's not a solution to the problem. But if we go to the next slide, uh, uh, Sandra also made a point. Let's just because yeah. you're on the service account, Sandra asked the question, and I think it just falls in the pool thing. But I I don't want to be wrong. If you use a service account, are you limited to something like 600 flows for that account? I don't think that's the case. It's that number of licensed users times 5,000 flows. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know how many flows an individual user can have. Um, I, I I don't know that there's a limit there. Um, oh, that I'm thinking. I'm talking executions, and she's yeah. asking how many flows can somebody own. Oh, yeah. um, I, I, yeah, I, don't I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, you know, if you're a really large organization and you have a lot of flows, you might have a a, a flow user per department or something. What if 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 you need to? I can I I went to the flow user per application, right? Too like if if you're writing flows that are that level, maybe that body of work deserves a flow like the the audit, you know, the compliance checker flow or the, you know, whatever. 
Right. Yeah, so what we're doing between Tom and I and another developer, we're using one service account to rewrite, you know, 800 flows or whatever. Do we get capped out at, I think each individual user can have up to 600 flows. And so I'm concerned, do we need to create another service account that has that name too, so. Well, I would, I would also argue that if you have 800 or whatever the number was of flows, uh, flows in, in work in SharePoint designer workflows that you, you might have the opportunity to reorganize that. So for example, instead of writing a flow that, that uh, acts on a trigger for every single list, there's an opportunity there to say, let's have one flow that on a, you know, every five minutes or every hour or every day, depending on how, how how critical that thing is that just scans across all of the lists that it, that would have that flow and acts on those items that have changed in the last five minutes. This hour. is your point here, Mark. This is your um, point on the slide, that, correct? That, that's that's part of part of that idea. So reusable flows, you know, the the flows that are not attached specifically to a list or library. Um, are, are you know for for example a reusable flow that that is connected to a content type well you can you can do that kind of scanning across a set of you know sites a set of libraries a set of you know whatever maybe you store those sort of places you check in a list and you iterate through that list and and run the logic if you can think about it you start to you start to do things in a little bit more of a development uh, way of thinking, but it can make your flows a lot easier to manage. And um, you know, the, the the sort of having the instant list trigger uh, thing is not always important. So you might want to think about about where you you could use this. You know, every day we sum up something instead of every you know two seconds or whatever. Um, so so reusable flows are again that that opportunity where I talked about you know maybe you have these little child flows that call one uh, sort of central engine flow uh, that same idea might apply you know in in your in Tom and, and in Sandra in your case where you've got whatever that number was 700 or 800 of them maybe maybe instead of 7 or 800 it could be 300 because you really have flows that are all doing the same thing and uh, you could just change the way you think about the triggers could be a we have another there. question from Thomas. Too. Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that um, Sandra did on one that we had was it was one list and we had like 28 different workflows that were sending out emails in particular cases. They were all manually triggered, stuff like mm -hmm. that. What she was able to do was we had to split it up because we hit the number of uh, items you could have in a case statement, but she was able basically to say, you know, when you go in, designate what type of thing that you're trying to do here. And then the workflow itself got to the point that said, case one, this type of thing, case two, this type of thing. So she took 28 workflows down to two. Yep. And that yeah. worked out really well. And, you, and you, could even, you could even imagine making that, uh, taking that another level. Have, have the, the flows that, that, do, 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 blah, 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 that do the triggers and have another flow that is a sending email engine that you pass certain parameters into. One of those parameters could be which template that's stored somewhere do I use to send the email? Good point. Can get really snazzy, but you know, obviously, when you're when you're doing this really quickly, you, you, may, not, <laughs> you may not take that sort of holistic architecture perspective. But you know, these are all tri tricks that you can use, and you'll find articles about this stuff from some of the some of the power automate gurus out there to uh, to sort of take yourself up a, up a level on on sort of the architecture of thinking. Hey, Mark, two minutes. Yeah, I know we're almost out of time. Workflow history. So we talked a little bit about the fact that, um, Catherine, your question about, you know, you want you definitely want to make sure you know who did what when. Well, workflow history is not something that exists with flows, but you can write information from a flow into any, any other list. So you can sort of build your own logging capability that meets your actual requirements as opposed to the way we used to think about the workflow history list. So Lots of options here. It's and a, you can also build a logging flow then to use yeah, it earlier. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you could, you could have one flow that does logging and you pass it in parameters and it sticks all of the log entries into, uh, you could have one list in the, in, in the sky, might get a little big. 
but um, you know you could break this up into lots of different componentry to help you uh, build things that are are going to be more maintainable more maintainable over time and also more uh, more uh, performant. Um, the another question that came up that I don't think we put in the slides speaking to workflow history is running workflows. So if you have 2010 workflows that are running and you, you're rewriting them in flow, at some point you sever that, you, you know, you 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 stop that running workflow, the 2010 workflow, and you switch to the flow. So you're gonna have to think about the, that transition. Workflows should always be written in such a way that they can be as re-entrant as possible. Um, so, you know, if something's at stage three of a 10 st stage process, it would be great if you your flow could sort of fire up and realize, oh, you're at stage three, I'm gonna keep going from here. So you'll want to think about that as well. And then the last slide is back to you, Mike. Sure. So um, we've taken a lot of our content from today and baked it into an infographic that, that Emily put together for us. So these pain points, execute steps, assessment steps, overall timeline and resources like Todd's blog post, et cetera, are all included in here. So the, uh, the infographic uh, URL is right here, simp info slash workflow. And you'll see uh, links directly to Todd's TK workflow blog series and the Microsoft um, announcements and other resources available for the Microsoft workflows to power automate. So there's a lot of very solid takeaways here that we'd encourage you to take advantage of. Uh, go crazy with them. And our next session, I know we're at time, is two weeks from now. And it's going to be focused on task management. So between to-do, outlook tasks, workflow ta assigned tasks, Azure DevOps, et cetera, um, what to use when for, for task management. So we've, we've begun formulating that already. So if you have additional questions on that or follow-up questions to today, please use the URL at the bottom, simp.info slash asksimpraxis. We're thrilled that you were able to attend. Really appreciate the feedback and, and the thoughts, hearing your own ideas from folks in the trenches. Um, we, all, we all learn from each other in these things as well. So thank you everybody for joining and we hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks also to Mark. Todd, Emily, and the whole team for uh, preparing all this content. Bye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.